Welcome to Golf and the Good Life, your guide to golf travel across the pond. I'm DJ Jones, joined as always by my good friend and colleague, Connor Evers. Connor, we've got a great episode ahead today uh, because this is a topic that every single golfer who is heading overseas will have to navigate at one point or another. I mean, for that matter, anyone who's traveling internationally will have to do the same. But before we get there, We've got a little news on the heels of our last episode from the Highlands of Scotland. DJ, thanks for the introduction. And like I said, always a pleasure to be with you. And you are right. A little follow up from last week. Great news at Royal Dornick. There will be a new clubhouse. Um, the members approved it um, last week. And the timeline for construction hasn't been announced yet, but um, the club does expect it to be open um, around 2027 or so, which will be around the 150th anniversary um, at Royal Dornick. So very special. There's been some renderings online. It looks cool. Um, there was one that there was a balcony, I think you could look out to kind of the first tee. So well, that's just kind of the update and a little follow up from last week's episode, DJ. Yeah, absolutely great stuff. And, you know, it's just proof that uh, overseas, the, the best just keep getting better. You know, that none of all of these clubs, you know, big and small alike, none of them are resting on their laurels. They're they're continuing to improve. And this is just the latest at Royal Dornick. I mean, here just within the last couple of years, they've had the new seventh hole and the new eighth tee. And now we've got a new clubhouse. And it just it's just from strength to strength, as they say. And in addition to Dornick, Royal Birkdale, host of the 2026 Open, uh, announced some changes as well. So just another example of, you know, continuing to raise the bar at these clubs across the pond. But moving to today's episode, today we're going to talk flights. And this is a topic that, like I said in the beginning, every single person traveling to play golf overseas will have to encounter because after all of the planning and the buildup and the excitement that has gone into this trip, your flight is your last major hurdle. You know, from an H&B perspective, it's the number one thing that causes calls to our quote unquote bat phone, which is our 24 seven hotline, where if something goes wrong with a trip, somebody gives us a call and reaches a senior member of the team and we help get you back in the fairway. Well, almost all of those calls, it seems, are flight cancel, missed connection, bags gone astray, clubs have gone astray, whatever it might be. And a lot of this, you know, it's, it's out of your control. You're, you're at the mercy of the airlines, unfortunately, for so much of it. But with that said, there are some choices that you can make in the planning process and when selecting your flight that will put the odds in your favor that you and your clubs and your luggage will all arrive on day one as scheduled. And really, in the end, that's all that matters when selecting your flight. So Connor, why don't you lead us off with the first of these tips and strategies, if you will, for your flights? Sure. Absolutely, DJ. And this is kind of the last thing you, you're going to want to book. Um, so you're going to wait for um, you know, everything to be confirmed from golf to transportation and lodging. And then once that's, those kind of three components are done, kind of gives you the go-ahead to start looking at flights it, and it really, it really depends a lot of things, especially kind of that, that first key factor of what you're doing that first day. You know, is it a walking tour of St. Andrews? Is it just hanging out and you know, walking around a, a city? Or if it's arrival day golf, you kind of need to understand what you're doing that first day, how much time you need to get from the airport to whichever location you're starting at and kind of the elapsed time between, between both. So the kind of the first main point that we'd like to share is really just communication and getting everyone on the same page. For example, if, if there is not communication amongst the group and all eight of you are just, Hey, we need to, you know, arrive June 1st and depart June 9th. And everyone just goes ahead and books flights without talking to each other. It can be an absolute chaotic mess to start off. For example, Aer Lingus into Dublin, they have a, a lot of flights that that are direct from the states to go over. And a lot of these flights, I mean, I, I know from uh, from Philadelphia, I believe, or New York, I mean, some of those flights get in around 5 a.m. to 5.30. And for example, if you have someone from, from Los Angeles, you know, that flight can get in around 2 p.m. So if you're not communicating and just assuming that everyone will be there at the same time, you never want to assume when it comes to booking flights like this, because there can be a multiple hour gap in between 
And really what all this comes down to is, is really driver hours if you do decide to hire a driver host. Again, we've talked in the past podcast, uh, DJ and I have done one directly about drivers and, and what have you. Again, drivers can drive about approximately eight hours per day and their time starts when they pick you up from the airport on that first day in country. So if everyone's you know arriving around that first time, that's great, um, you know around an hour or so from each other. So those are kind of the main factors, but just communication is extremely key. So just make sure everyone's on the same page when it comes to flights and having a great group captain that will you know designate, hey, this is the time we should arrive, this is the time we should depart based on our itinerary. That is key as well to keeping all the logistics straight. Yeah, with all of your decisions, not just your flight. I mean, with with everything that's happening, communication, communication, communication. It's just so vitally important. Start a text thread, but most importantly, read the texts, read the emails, whether they're coming from your group captain or your golf travel company or your hotel or golf courses or whatever it might be, read that communication because it, it all ties into your experience in the end. And like you said, if you've got guys arriving over a five hour period, and then you've got a four hour drive ahead of you to your first destination, some of the guys are going to be stuck uh, because they're, the driver's not simply not going to be able to wait uh, all of that time. And the other thing is, if you think about the beginning of a trip, some of the most exciting moments all kind of happen right at the very beginning. You arrive, everybody's kind of excited, you're getting going. It's, you know, the, the excitement is kind of reaching that crescendo. If six or seven of, of your group are all on one flight and you're the lone ranger that went a different time because you saved a couple hundred dollars on, a, on an earlier flight, you miss out on all that. You don't want to be the one guy that rolls in five hours later while everybody has chosen their seat on the coach, chosen their hotel room or their room in the lodge or whatever it might be, and miss out on all of that early banter. It's a small thing, but it does matter. And it, and it will you know, make a difference in terms of your first memories from, from the trip. But moving on to the next one, when it comes to selecting your flight, I'm going to paraphrase Hamilton and say that the plan is nonstop. Any time that you can fly direct to a, your destination or close to it, as opposed to connecting, that should always be your choice. You know, whether it means going with a carrier that may not be your favorite, or maybe you don't have status with them, or maybe the fare is not quite as uh, favorable as some of the others. By doing so, you're going to eliminate the number one risk when it comes to you know arriving late or your luggage going sideways, and that's a connection. Every takeoff and landing is a friction point. It's a chance for something to go awry. The other thing to keep in mind as well is that when it comes to these international flights, they are the big time money makers for the airlines. And so it is in their best interest to ensure that that flight gets off the ground as scheduled as opposed to one of the 20 flights to Atlanta that day that maybe isn't a big deal. So by being on that flight, again, you're you're kind of putting yourself in a little bit of a priority over that first leg connection where you know maybe it gets scrubbed and, and they don't think twice about it. So anytime you can, go direct, even if it means driving a little further to an airport that isn't always your first choice. The example I would give is I live in Orlando. There are some direct flights from here that are not available in Tampa. Drive over from Tampa. It's a two-hour drive, but eliminating that connection and, again, that friction point, in the end, it could make all the difference to ensure that you get there on time and hit that first round of golf that's on your itinerary. Yeah, definitely. Connections aren't fun, but like the DJ said, if, if you can have that direct flight, it is key. And yeah, I, I mean, specifically just for Ireland, Aer Lingus, um, the Irish airline there, I mean, they have tons of, of flights from North America that are direct. Like I said, they have one from Los Angeles, and I believe they have one from Seattle and a few others. So there's a lot of major cities throughout the States and, and you know Canada too that uh, that have direct ones over, which is which is always great. And our next point is to allow plenty of extra time for that connection if you do have one. So, for example, I like to kind of say and in, in, say if you're here in our, our home city where HQ is in Cincinnati and, and you're flying from Cincinnati to New York and from New York to Edinburgh. And when you're looking at your flights and booking them, say if you're preferred airline and you have examples and, and kind of two different offerings, maybe it's the same price, but you have a three or four hour layover compared to a one hour layover. 
the one hour layover, yes, maybe more time back home before you leave, but we would tend to recommend you to book that that flight that has that longer layover. I would rather have you be waiting in the airport than maybe miss connection or something's delayed in that first flight and you can't make that flight. And a lot of times they don't have a lot of other other flights, for example, on, you know, on, on Delta through JFK to Edinburgh. I mean, they have one per day. So if you do miss that, a lot of times you're going to hang out in that city for essentially 24 hours and you'll miss that first day. So I'd rather have you have that extra time. Get, if you have lounge access, great. If you don't, you know, you can some a lot of them you can you can pay for a daily pass. Sometimes it's thirty to fifty dollars and just hang out there until your flight departs. Um, but like I said, I would rather have you have that extra time in that connecting airport rather than missing that first day. Yeah, we talked on the past episode about uh, packing and and defensive packing. Well, this is just defensive flight selection. Don't put yourself in the position where you've got forty seven minutes to connect in Atlanta. <laughs> it's just asking for trouble, manage your risk, you know, add that extra time, get a coffee, catch up on the email, whatever it might be. You're going to be so thankful that you had that time. If that outgoing flight happens to be, uh, happens to be delayed and dealing with the topic of connections. I mean, obviously, like we just said, avoid them if possible, but a lot of times it's, it's inevitable. And so there's basically two options here when it comes to selecting where to connect whether you connect here in the States or overseas. And there are some pros and cons to both. And we don't necessarily lean one way or the other. It really is just going to come down to what is the best choice for not only for the flight schedule, but maybe for what you have in schedule, have scheduled that first day in terms of arrival times and all of that. If you connect abroad, you know, the the upside here is that you've got more flights usually from, say, let's say you connect in London, well, you're going to have more options available if you should happen to miss your connection to still get you to your final destination. So, you know, let's say you're trying to get to Aberdeen. If you happen to miss that connection, you've probably got other options to choose from, or you can hop on the train as we've had to kind of navigate, help folks navigate many times in the past. You, you've got some choices there, or at least more than you have stateside, because like Connor just said, Oftentimes, the Philly to Dublin flight, there's one that day, and and if you miss that connection, you're you're stuck till the next day. So that's going to be the advantage to overseas. The downside is you've got to you've got a couple headaches with that connection, and that you've got to go through customs and the recheck of the bag and so forth. And so again, if you have shortchanged yourself on time, that could be a, a, a recipe for a tough start to your trip. On the other hand, if you connect stateside. You eliminate that customs situation with with the connection. So you you know you have a much more leisurely connection at your disposal, but again, only you know limited options in terms of getting those flights that are heading overseas. So really, it, what it ultimately comes down to is finding you know the best of both worlds, where you've got plenty of connection time, and ideally you're avoiding some problematic airports in terms of connection. And we're going to touch more on that here in a moment. Uh, but that would be kind of the sweet spot to choosing where you where you connect. Also, you know, it doesn't hurt to invest a few minutes looking at your backup plans. You know, maybe you've only got 90 minutes and it should be enough, but just in case, look into what's out there. Maybe British Airways has some more flights or there's an easy jet taking the train. It never hurts to just have that uh, that knowledge in your back pocket, so that if something goes sideways, you know exactly what to do. That you know, if you've got an expert in your back pocket as well, uh, it certainly helps. If you if you don't and you're going it alone, no biggie. Just think ahead, look at what's out there. If you're prepared, it's not that big of a deal. It's fantastic advice, DJ. It is it is great. It, it's international travel. Things do happen. You know, unfortunately, it's just inevitable. So like you said, if you have that backup plan, that's great. Like you said, if you're in London Heathrow and you're trying to get to, you know, say Inverness and the flight's delayed or, or just canceled, I mean, hey, take take the train. That is the beauty of Europe. Is there's a there's a great train system within there. So it's a little bit, a little bit easier to get from point A to point B. And our next point is. Avoid London Heathrow or Charles de Gaulle in Paris. Uh, both of these airports are notorious for just being problematic when it comes to 
luggage and uh, flight connections being canceled or or delayed or what have you. I'm sure all the folks that work at both airports are great people, but the the airports sometimes can can be a little bit challenging in getting through. Um, I've connected in, in Heathrow a few times and Charles de Gaulle once. And at both times were delayed uh, multiple hours, to be honest with everyone. So um, just my example of, of many, the customs at Charles de Gaulle can be a little bit of a pain. I connected there and uh, was going um, you know, out uh, to more Eastern Europe and it just can be. So avoid both those airports. If you can, again, take our advice, look at a, a, a direct flight if you can, or just look at some other options of, of other airports. Um, you know, Dublin can be great. Again, Aer Lingus has a lot of, uh, uh, direct flights now. I mean, they even started a flight from Cleveland. So um, even if you're not going to Ireland, your last destination is in, in say, Scotland. I mean, a lot of times you can actually get direct flights on Aer Lingus from Dublin into to Scotland. Um, Manchester is also another great one. Um, Amsterdam, I have found, has been great. Uh, connected there once to Poland, and um, it's a great, great little airport. Not little, but a large airport, but uh, they, they're very, very efficient with everything there. And also London Gatwick. Um, London also has multiple different airports. Um, Gatwick has some connections there too. And if you do have to go through Charles de Gaulle or London Heathrow, again, just take our advice and add a little bit extra time there. Um, and you know, a lot of times if you're flying from London, say to Edinburgh, there's multiple flights, especially in the summer months, um, from both destinations. So you know, not all hope is lost. You know, there may be one that, that another flight coming up, um, that you may be able to be listed on as well afterwards, if you are delayed or, can, or, or canceled. So not to be the bear of bad news on that one, but, but just something to look into when you're booking your flights. Yeah, that's absolutely great advice, especially with CDG. I mean, I just have, you know, it gives me anxiety just sitting here thinking about the last time I connected through there. But what's nice is with the travel economy being so strong, the airlines, like you said, they are adding so many, you know, nonstops from the states, from a lot of cities that you wouldn't anticipate. So there's more options, you know, kind of coming online all the time. Delta added some to Shannon. Uh, I think it was just last week. So the reliance on Heathrow and Charles de Gaulle uh, is is going down. And, and, and that's a that's a very good thing. And, you know, one of the, the things with Heathrow in particular, they seem to be really great at losing golf clubs. Mm. And that kind of ties in to our our next piece of advice. And that is to think about your golf clubs when you know making your selection because you might be able to get by without your checked luggage but this is a golf trip and you want to have your sticks candidly over the last year or so the choice here has kind of narrowed because there was a time when we would have said without hesitation ship your golf clubs it avoids so much stress it you get a lot of peace of mind you know that they're sitting there waiting on you but over the last year or two ever since really the international restart of travel, it's kind of been 50-50, you know, between shipping your clubs or airlines, they both have challenges in terms of delays. And so number one, if you're going to fly with your clubs, this is another big advantage for flying nonstop. It's one less person to touch your golf bag and put it in the wrong cart or however they send it to the next plane. I don't know. And then again, giving yourself plenty of connection time, you know, oversized bags. I don't know how they move through the airport, but I feel like you need more time for one to change planes. And so give yourself the best odds of your clubs getting there. If you're going to ship them, the two pieces of advice are if the shipping company that you've chosen, whatever day they tell you to mail them, add a few days to that. Because lately, the challenge has been with customs. Bags have been getting stuck in customs, and that can often be a, a multi-day delay in some, some of these cases. And the reason they often get in, stuck in customs deals with tip number two, and that is go through your golf bag and make sure 100% that you don't have anything in your bag that is prohibited in terms of the shipping. Because oftentimes, it's something like a lighter that you had on the course for smoking a cigar. And then the bag gets flagged for something that you didn't even remember was in the bag and it's stuck there for days. And the downside is that many of the uh, the terms and conditions when it comes to uh, shipping the clubs, they don't cover or reimburse if it's stuck because of customs. Then you're out not only your clubs, but you're out spending your money 
on rentals and whatever the case might be. So whether you're shipping or putting them on the airplane, choose wisely. You know, don't shortchange yourself either in terms of time and make sure that you've got your bag packed the way that it should be. Now, there's advantages and, and and cons, if you will, from both both options when it comes to traveling with your golf clubs across the pond. Another advice on, on that, you know, a lot of the, the travel companies for, for clubs, they'll send you some documents uh, to fill out for customs and make sure everything is filled out. There may be some questions on there that you think you may not need to fill out and you put a line through it or disregard it. Don't do that um, because that can also delay the process as well. Um, and as DJ said, make sure all those little knickknacks are out of your golf bag. I take all your clubs, everything on your golf bag, shake everything out, make sure everything's out just to double check and make sure, check all the pockets of your golf travel bag along with your clubs and just, just make sure everything is out. Have another person do a sweep through it just to avoid any delays that may cause some you know confusion and headache once you're across the pond. And just kind of some final thoughts here while we kind of wrap up the episode. Um, you know, my, my kind of first bullet point there is you know, go, a, go a day early. Um, you know, you are traveling across multiple different time zones. It's tough on the body. Um, so maybe just go a day early, stay in a hotel like right by the airport, um, adjust, adjust to the time and then start your trip there. You know, that'll be a huge benefit once you play that first round of golf. If, if you have a tight schedule for that first day, if you're doing a tour, what have you, it just makes sure that you're there if there are any issues with flights and then we've come kind of that first point that we said is just communicate with your group make sure everyone's on the same plan same kind of mindset from when you are uh, expected to arrive and expected to depart um that is that is key so just communicate with everyone uh, maybe do a spreadsheet of when all the flights are going to arrive and depart um, and when someone books it try to all book around that same time which is great so no one's just kind of hanging out in the airport and being kind of that lone wolf like you said dj and just add more connection time we've talked about it multiple times times just just reiterating it again if you have that option between an hour layover or a three hour layover just go up to three hours just to make sure so that's kind of my final thoughts dj yeah it's all great stuff because you know again you've put a lot of time and effort and energy and, and excitement has been building for months and months you know ahead of this trip and while the flight is largely out of your control in terms of whether it you know takes off on time the choices that you've made can all ultimately make a big impact in terms of whether you get there on time and you and whether you're hit on the first tee as scheduled. So choose your flight wisely is the overall message. And we've actually covered a lot of this and some other tips uh, in a guide on our website. We'll be sure to link to that in the show notes. But if you have any questions or something that we didn't cover, send us a DM on social media or shoot us an email, golf at haversham.com. But otherwise, thank you as always for tuning in. We'll be back again soon with another episode. But until then, we wish you plenty of golf at its finest and life at its best. 